Good. <laughs> Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And welcome here this day in the new book, United Methodist Church. I am so happy to be with you. If you don't know who I am, uh, my name's in the bulletin, I think. Yeah, yeah there I am. Uh, did you check on that? Yeah, I did. Uh, I'm known as uh, Pastor Truett Andrews. I'm the associate pastor of the Sicklerville Church, uh, the other side of the bridge. And uh, I am uh, trying to be retired, but it doesn't work. Uh, so those of you that look forward to retiring, just forget about it. It doesn't, it doesn't ever come. So uh, your pastor is away. Uh, he just called me in the middle of the week and asked if I was available, and yes, I am. Always glad to be here and see your smiling faces. And some of you, you I know, and uh, some of you know me, and that's all right. Uh, if you want to know where my sweet, charming, lovely wife is, it was her turn to torment the three-year-olds today. Uh, uh, so I think she's got about seven or eight of them, so uh, she couldn't be with me this morning. So, uh, this is the day which the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be exceedingly glad in it, and let us bow for a moment of prayer. Almighty God, to you all hearts are known and all desires are known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
faith this morning is found in the back of your hymnals on page 880. The back of your hymnals, page 880. An affirmation of faith. And I'd like to do something slightly different with this affirmation of faith this morning. I know you're kind of used to probably running right through it, but <clears throat> I want to teach you the way the early church did this. You see, they did it in sort of a responsive reading. You did one line, and I did the other. And I'd like to try that this morning, yeah. because it is kind of long, and it is kind of, you know, it, you can get lost in it sometimes. So let's try this. <coughs> I'm going to do the first line, and you're going to do the, the next line, and you'll find out that it just might work. <clears throat> we believe in one God. The Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through the name all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven was incarnate with the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. And he became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death with authority. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven. And then he seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory. To judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We hope for the resurrection of the dead and, and for the life, life of the, of the world, world to come. come. Amen. Amen. this morning as we would worship? Is that a yes over there? No, that's just waiting for somebody. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> it's nice that you're friendly. <laughs> Two unspoken prayers. And last week I had asked for prayers for even Charlie. He has gone through quite a bit in the past year and a half, and he passed away on Thursday morning. So, but still continue for the prayers of Eve and her family. And then Harriet spoke with me, and she said, Helen, you have to take up my five minutes on Sunday. I said, no, I am not doing five minutes, so I'm gonna tell it short and sweet. Harriet is doing well, but in a lot of pain. She is taking it easy. There's certain things she had to be taken off of, and she said, I am doing this according to God's will. God made my body, God will heal my body, and she's going to suffer through it, and this is what she wants. I asked her about food. She said, no, they bring me food. I take two bites, and I'm afraid I'm going to waste food if people bring me food. Yesterday, she texted me. I went in and made two eggs for myself, but now I'm done. I said, what do you mean done? I'm going to go to sleep. So I said, okay. So this morning, she texted and said, I'm still going forward. Please tell my church family that I need prayer. Prayer is what you can give me and do for me. She said, everything else my family is doing and I will do 
because I'm listening to the doctors. So at the very end, I said, Harriet, can you please explain why? And I asked her if you mind me saying this. She said, no. Why did you actually collapse on the floor in the kitchen? And what was the final diagnosis when you left the hospital? And she said they came in after extensive testing of the heart, and there are a few things, but she, the doctor told her COVID was already starting in her body, took over, lowered her brush, blood pressure, and that's why she collapsed on, collapsed on the kitchen floor. So she said, Helen, stand up and tell them what I said. Just pray for me, and I'm okay. So there you go, that's how we Okay. I want to praise God for your choir this morning. Oh. The, the, uh, the Sicklerville Church will have 250 people worshiping over there this morning and no choir. No choir. And they won't have a choir next week either. And they don't have a choir. They're going to have a choir, a special choir for uh, Palm Sunday, and they usually have a special one for Easter Sunday, but no, they don't have a choir. Oh. And that, uh, I like to hear a choir. <laughs> Thank you. You, you, you do, do, take do. that as praise <laughs> for the day. Uh, the music here has always been wonderful when I come here to worship. I also received a text from Carla. Uh, okay. And uh, she said they're right now they're in Florida. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, they were in South Carolina, now they're in Florida. And uh, she asked for prayers. Um, she asked for prayers for her son, uh, Matthew. Uh, so that's prayer. And I thank God for my daughter is doing very well from her open heart surgery. She had a good checkup on this past week. Still not able to drive, so I'm her Uber. Is that what you call it? Uber? <laughs> That'll work. I'm her Uber. And, um, but she's doing very well. And I thank you very much for all the wonderful prayers. He listens, he hears. You know, I have a, an acquaintance who was hit by a car right on a very busy street, just blocks from where he and we live. And he's recuperating in a rehab center and uh, he could use some prayers, not only now, but for when he is released. His name is Bill. And uh, that's all I have to say about that. I, I haven't seen him since a um, year and a half or so ago, but I heard about this and, and uh, thought prayers the least we could do. Bill. Let us go to prayer. Thank you. <coughs> Gracious Father, it's such a great day. The sun is bright. The breeze is refreshing. We heard the frogs chirping. And we're just so happy to be here in this holy place with your holy people to worship you this morning. We recognize, O oh God, that you alone are the God of creation. You alone are the God that can provide redemption for us, a very sinful people. And you alone are the God that can provide us with divine comfort each day of our lives, every place that we may go. And you go with us every footstep. stumble and fall, oh God. You are more willing to pick us up and carry us to our destination than we are even to ask. Oh God, we're so grateful you're with us this morning. We thank you for the healing nature that you have provided for us. We thank you, oh God, for the travel mercies that have been granted. We take joy, O oh God, in the shepherd of this congregation. Lord, there 
there are some concerns that we have others. One we know so well seems to be going through quite a few stipulations of life. We ask that you allow this church to reach out to her in whatever comfortable way. We ask, O oh God, for those that have been injured, that you grant them a sense of wholeness that can be had only through Jesus Christ our Lord. of a strange nation and we're progressing through a time when change is inevitable. We ask that you guide this nation in all the decisions that need to be made <laughs> and help it to be understood throughout the world. still one nation under the guidance and direction of Almighty God. Now, O oh Lord, renew a right spirit within us. Enable us to rejoice in the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And perhaps when our memories begin to fade, we will remember those things that we were taught as children even as you taught your disciples in saying, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Will you join with me in turning your hymnals to hymn number 419, I am thine, O Lord. Number 419, I am thine, O Lord. If you're able to stand, will you join me in singing this wonderful hymn?
I was so excited about hearing the choir I wanted to hear. <laughs>
to the Lord and leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Leave it there. The scripture that I would offer for your consideration this morning are very familiar words, but they may come from a different portion of the Bible than what you may expect. So listen very carefully to what the psalmist says in Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. O oh my God, I cry by day, but thou dost not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. Yet thou art holy, O oh, thou who art enthroned upon the praises of Israel. In thee our fathers trusted. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. In thee they cried out and were delivered. In thee they trusted and were not dis disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lips. They wag their head. May God bless to our hearts some understanding of this, his holy word, and allow me to enlighten you behind the cross of Calvary that Jesus may be high and lifted up, that our lives might be changed, and we might sense the wholeness of his spirit. Let us pray. Our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful place where we can worship you in spirit and in truth, knowing that this is truly your desire. Help us, Lord, even now, that we might be one with you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, commercial. The Sickleville Church every Saturday night through Lent, and there's two more Sundays in Lent, meets in the old church, that's the one over by the cemetery, and we have soup, salad, and sacrament. We serve soup and salad and a cookie, and then we go into the little church, and then we have our Lenten services, and yep, I'm preaching, <laughs> and uh, this is the sermon that I preached last night for those people, and uh, I hope you will get something from it. You know, there's an old story. I was a little surprised when I told the story that everyone in that congregation there laughed last night. But I'm gonna tell it to you to see if, it's an old story, you should have known it. It, it occurred down at Malaga Camp, so they tell me. They, they had an evangelist there preaching, and he was really getting inspired at the message that he was trying to deliver to the people. And he got to that point in his sermon, and he went out and said, do you want to go to heaven? And there was a murmuring sort of, yes. And he, he got just a little bit more inspired and said, do you all want to go to heaven? And, and there, was a, there was a clamoring from the congregation, that, except for the guy sitting over here in the corner. He just sort of <laughs> murmured a little bit. And, and he was even more inspired. And he said, do you all want to go to heaven? And they all came back with one glorious claim. Yes, we want to go to heaven. <laughs> except for this one little guy over here in the corner that just sort of murmured. And the preacher, I was a little taken back. 
So he, he elected to, to climb down off the steps and, and go over and talk to him immediately. I would do so, but I'd probably fall. <laughs> and he says, you don't want to go to heaven. And the man said, oh, yes, of course I want to go to heaven, but I, I kind of thought you were going to leave right now. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you want to go? What are, you, what are your expectations when you get there? I know you could turn into revelations and you could read some very interesting facts about the new Jerusalem, the holy city, heaven if you like, paradise if you like. But I want to tell you a few things that are found in Revelation. You don't go in there in Revelation, Revelations and, and find them yourselves. I don't like preaching from Revelations unless you have heard all my sermons on Daniel and all my sermons on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That takes about 40 years. <laughs> but Revelations gives us a little picture of what this new Jerusalem, this heaven, is like. First of all, it's kind of big. Depending upon what language you're using to translate those figures that are there, you could wind up with a city that is perfectly square, some 1,400 or 1,500 miles square. Now, the reason for this deviation in numbers that I'm giving you is, first of all, we really don't know how to count in Hebrew. Anybody here know how to count in Hebrew? I know for a fact every one of you knows. Let me check. Yep. Every one of you here knows how to count in Aramaic. Sure you do. Follow along with me. One. Two. You're not following me. Three. Four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You all speak Aramaic. You thought that was English? No. English has those funny little things, you know, the V's and, and, and the C's and the M's and the L's. That's English. One would call them Roman numerals, but for the longest while, hundreds, if not a thousand years, the English used that form to identify numbers. And then finally in the Crusades, <laughs> after they'd been defeated by the Muslims, they decided to adopt their numbering system. So you can get slightly confused even if you should go back and try and count in Hebrew, you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. No, there's no ten. There's only one. I'm serious. That's the way they do things. So counting in all of history has been weird. So the size of heaven is somewhere between 1,400 and 1,500 square miles. And it has three gates on each side. The three on the north, three on the south, three on the east, and three on the west. And these gates are 72 miles wide. Mm. And they're made of one pearl. Mm. Can you imagine? The value of that, you know, we take great 
pride in having a string of pearls to give to our loved one. I, I personally have bought the finest artificial pearls that I could <laughs> find and gave them to my wife. She never wears them. <laughs> and then the insides of heaven. Half of heaven is occupied by the throne of God, where Jesus sits. Well, actually, it's where Almighty God sits, and Jesus sits on the right hand, that candle. That's why we light it first. We bring the light of the world into the church, and we put it there as a representation. So Jesus sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty and looks out at you. Half of heaven is occupied by all this space. And one quarter, one quarter of all this space is taken up with the roads, the streets of heaven. <clears throat> and they're paved with gold. Now let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. If I were to give you a bucket of tar, what would you do with it? Paint the roof. <laughs> <laughs> Go out and find yourself a pothole, maybe. <laughs> A bucket of gold in God's eyes are just as worthless because he has taken that gold, that substance that we consider so valuable, and he has strung it out on his streets. He has made my heaven an environmental disaster. Gold, soft, pliable, has to be cleaned. Gold. And then one quarter of the space is left for you and me and anybody else that he likes to come. And I'm told that if you mathematically compute this out, Everyone that has forever been born and everyone that will be born for the next 250 years, if they should all go to heaven, we would all have a backyard the size of the state of New Jersey. Who's going to cut that grass? <laughs> Sheesh! And then there's that old, old song, you know, I've got a mansion over the hilltop in that bright land where it'll never grow old. It's got a thousand rooms in it. <laughs> Who's going to clean all those bathrooms? <laughs> Come on now. Is this what you're looking forward to? Let me give you something better to look forward to. By looking at the cross of Calvary, Jesus is nailed there. He's been there for three hours in pain and agony, deep, dark depression, excessive misery. He knows now, without a doubt, a shadow of doubt in his mind, he is going to die. Because this is God's plan for him so that we might be saved. Do you know the song? There's always a song in there, always a song, <laughs> always a song. He could have saved, see, he could have sent 10,000 angels to save him from the cross. But if they came and saved him from dying, this whole world still be lost. It was a sinful world. 
that Jesus was born into. Numerous times throughout history, God had tried to deal with the sinfulness of man. A flood. He scattered them with various languages. He set up a prime example of a people of how to live and gave them commandments, guidelines for living. It didn't work. The world was still full of sinful people. Selfish, self-centered, egotistical people who only live day to day for their only self-preservation. They needed a better example. So God became incarnate. He became flesh to dwell amongst us in our sinful nature. And then he allowed all the sins of the world to focus in on this Christ Jesus and put him on a cross there to die. And Jesus speaks from the cross about the third hour. And he calls out in a very strange language, a language that we really don't have an understanding of, for it's neither Greek nor Hebrew. Rest assured, it's not English. It could possibly be Phoenician. And how I say that it could possibly be Phoenician because we've completely lost the Phoenician language. We never wrote it down any place. When you get in a desperate situation, your human nature resorts to the language and understanding and training of when you were a child. That is why we need to train our children and bring them up into the way so that when the hardships of life are approached upon, we have both a language and a nature and a sustaining God that can benefit us and help us through the trials and tribulations of life. And Jesus cries out from the cross, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And then we find out that it is quite natural in the scriptures that when we use a language to try and quote something, and we don't know what it means, we then put in parentheses after it several times throughout the scripture what it meant. And it's Jesus talking to the Father, the creator of the universe. Why have you forsaken me? And yes, on the cross of Calvary, God turned his back upon his only begotten son because he could not look upon sin. And that's exactly what Jesus was doing there on the cross. He took the sins of all the world upon himself. And he was going to die. And he was going to take that sin down into the pits of hell say here it is but you can't keep me you can keep the sin but you can't keep me and you're not going to be able to keep my children my people my church my family because they are mine the father has now given them to me but for right now, the loneliness upon that cross of Calvary. What is heaven? What is hell? I'll tell you what heaven is. Heaven is the presence of the living God. 
to be there in the presence of the one and only source of love for us. Just picture yourselves in a position as many people find themselves as they progress in time. That's my language for saying getting old. <laughs> our nursing homes, our assisted living facilities, even individuals that live by themselves, alone, even sometimes when we're living with someone, we're alone. Sometimes when we're living with the entire family, we'd like to be alone. <laughs> but to be alone, separated from family, separated from love, separated from the presence of God, that is hell. Forget about the fire and brimstone. Forget about the weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. They are given to us because we are human beings and we need visual pictures of what's happening in this world. But I want you to understand and accept the presence of the living God. That when we leave this place, this earthly place, we shall be in the presence of pure love. And understanding and a fellowship one with another and the music will be absolutely stupendous and we will all be a part of that but there will be others that have not accepted the role that Jesus would play in their life they have not experienced the wholeness of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And yes, there may come a point in their life when God will turn his back upon them and say simply, I never knew you. The choice is quite simple. To be in the presence of God, in the presence of those that love us, or separated in darkness, in agony, having no contact with love. Jesus calls out because this was God's plan, but the end result is that God's plan and the forgiveness of all people could take place. Your sins have been forgiven. You might still use the United Methodist hymnal formally and get to that point in the ritual where it is announced. Your sins are forgiven. That is not some priest up here doing some holier than thou thing. That is a proclamation of the congregation to one another. Your sins are forgiven. Praise the Lord. At that one point in time, you are truly a holy people. But don't open your eyes because you'll shortly sin again. But we do these things in remembrance that we can achieve that oneness, that perfect relationship with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Jesus crawls out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that all of humankind can experience salvation through the love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you turn in your hymnals to hymn number 714?
number 714, I know whom that I have believed. If you are able to stand with me, will you stand and join some 714, I know whom I have believed. Son of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.